The New Testament book of Acts is usually understood to mean that this book concerns the Acts of the Apostles. But some scholars have said that it would be better named the Acts of the Holy Spirit because the central character who is manifested in this book is the third person of the Trinity who enables, empowers, and who leads his church into its earliest period of expansion. Now we know that the book of Acts was written by Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke, and the book of Acts is more or less the Gospel of Luke, chapter or volume two, where Luke carries on the narrative history of the early church from the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, and then tells us how the church grew and moved into its uh, appointed field of labor. Now, it's important for us, if we're going to understand the book of Acts, to see something of the outline that the author of the book follows. Now, you remember that when Jesus gave his great commission to his disciples before he left, he told them that they were to be his witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now think about it, that it begins in Jerusalem. Now in what part of Palestine do we find Jerusalem? It's in Judea, in the southern part of the country. And Galilee is in the north. And the northern part of the country is separated or divided from the south, which is Judea, by Samaria. And so what Jesus does is command the church to move basically out from the center in concentric circles so that the ministry of the Christian church, the newborn church, begins in Jerusalem then moves out to the circle of Judea, and then goes and incorporates Samaria, and from there to all the world, into the uttermost parts of the earth. And the way the book moves, the book of Acts, is that it begins in Jerusalem and tells us what is happening in the primitive church in Jerusalem, and then we begin to hear of its expansion into Judea. Then the Samaria and the, the, the largest section of the book follows after the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul, who then is taking the gospel to the Gentiles, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, to see how this progresses, that is to get a taste of it, let's look for a second at the 8th chapter of the books, the book of uh, Acts. Chapter 7 tells us the story of the martyrdom of Stephen. And we read that Saul, who was the Pharisee that was persecuting the church, was consenting to the death of Stephen. And then in chapter 8 we read, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Let me just stop there. We see what moves the expansion of the church at this period in history is persecution. And the persecution Luke is describing here at this point is not the persecution that would come later at the hands of the Roman Empire, but this is a local persecution that is going on in Jerusalem. And the persecution becomes so severe, and one of the leading persecutors is this fellow Saul of Tarsus. But as a result of the heat that comes in this persecution, the original church is scattered. The rank and file is scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Now what I 
left off was the end of that sentence that I just read, and I did it on purpose. Let me read the full uh, statement again. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And then we read in verse 4, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Now one of the things we have to understand about the early church was there really was the priesthood of all believers operating in this community. Because the gospel that was being preached and expanding and penetrating outward from Jerusalem initially was not being carried by the apostles. But rather, the whole church was scattered, all were scattered, we were told, except the apostles, and that those who were scattered went preaching the gospel. And so it was the body of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, in the midst of persecution, that went and penetrated the world, and they became known as the people who turned the world upside down. Because there was, even though the apostle established church offices with elders and deacons and that sort of thing, nevertheless, the whole church was given the responsibility to make sure that the mission and the commission of Christ was carried out to all the world. Now, in this same chapter, we read the record of Philip's going down to the city of Samaria and preaching Christ there and meeting this sorcerer who was called Simon. Verse 9 said, There was a certain man called Simon who, was previously who had previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. And Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now, in verse 14, Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So what we read here is of the advancement of the gospel in the Samaria. And with the first converts to Christ in Samaria, when these people believed and the news got back to Jerusalem, a delegation of the apostles went to Samaria to investigate this when they heard that the gospel had penetrated Samaria of all places. And they asked the question, have you received the Holy Spirit? And the answer was no, they had not. And so the Holy, so that the apostles then laid their hands on the Samaritan believers, and they all received the Holy Ghost. Now, if we would go on in the book of Acts, we would see a similar phenomenon that took place in chapter 10. Well, let's look at it for a second, which gives us the record of what happens at the household of Cornelius. Chapter 10 of Acts says this, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Now, 
who is this fellow Cornelius, that, to whom a couple of chapters are, are devoted in the book of Acts. So far, we've simply read that he was a devout man. Now, in the New Testament, we encounter several different groups of people. We meet the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the zealots, and all these different groups. But in terms of the early church, one of the overarching questions that the first century church faced was, how do these different groups of people that we encounter fit into the church? And the four chief groups of people about which the New Testament was concerned in terms of their status in the church community were, first of all, the Jews, then the Samaritans, then the third group who were God-fearers, and the fourth group were simply called the Gentiles. Now we know that the church in the New Testament began with Jewish converts. The day of Pentecost occurred in the midst of a Jewish feast, the Feast of Pentecost. And all of those who were empowered by the Holy Ghost on that day were Jewish believers. And the Jewish converts to the Messiah became the core and the nucleus of the first century church. But now the gospel is reaching beyond the Jewish community. And people are being converted to Christ who are from these other groups, the first group of which is the group known as the Samaritans. Now we know from the gospels that there was this deep-rooted hostility and animosity that existed between Jews and Samaritans. And we are even told that the Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. So when the news comes back to Jerusalem that a group of Samaritans had received Christ and believed the teaching of the kingdom of God, it is not surprising that a delegation was sent there to investigate this. And then what happens is that when the apostles go to the Samaritans and interrogate the believers and find that they had not yet received the endowment of the Holy Spirit, what did they do? Did they stand back and say, well, I'm sorry, the full measure of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we received in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost is not for you. You're Samaritans. You can be part of the kingdom of God, but forever you must remain as second-class citizens. On the contrary, the apostles laid their hands on the Samaritans, and the Samaritans received the Holy Ghost. Now that's crucial to the book of Acts, and it's crucial to the whole New Testament understanding of the church. Because now, at least, we see that the church is not restricted to Jews. The body of Christ now includes Samaritans. Samaritans who have embraced Jesus. Samaritans who have been anointed with the Holy Ghost. Now, the next group about which there is a question is that group called the God-fearers. Now, the God-fearers were basically Greek-speaking people like Cornelius. They were Gentiles who had been partially converted to Judaism. Now, when I say partially converted, what I mean is this. If a Gentile wanted to convert to Judaism at this time in history, they had to do several things. First of all, <clears throat> they had to embrace the teachings of the covenant, the teachings of Moses, the teaching of the law, and so on. That is, they had to make a profession of faith in the doctrines of Judaism. Secondly, they had to undergo a purification bath because they were considered to be unclean since they were Gentiles. And thirdly, and most significantly, they had to be circumcised. Now, it's one thing for babies to be circumcised. 
It's another thing for fully grown adult males to undergo the rite of circumcision. And so a lot of these men who were converted to the teachings of the Old Testament said, I believe I want to be part of the group, but if it's all the same to you, I would like to be excused from the rite of circumcision. And so these people were received really as kind of a second uh, level type of member in the community who were regarded not as full-fledged Jews, but neither were they regarded simply as outcast Gentiles, but they were given the name God-fearers. And that's the kind of person Cornelius was. He was in that group. And so we have to ask ourselves, why did Luke give so much attention to this account of Cornelius? Now we read in, in chapter 10, that in, in verse uh, 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. Now again, one of the major themes of Luke, both in the Gospel and the book of Acts, is to show the universality of the application of the Gospel. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And then he goes on and gives a summary of the ministry of Jesus. Now, in verse 44, we read, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. What is being recorded here? is kind of a mini Pentecost. Just as the Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost with the Jews, then later it fell on the Samaritan believers, now it is falling upon the God-fearers connected with Cornelius and his household. Now Peter answered, that is, he spoke to this astonishment of the Jews who were present who couldn't understand how these uncircumcised people could be receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and they asked him to stay a few days. So how does Peter read this experience? He said, hey, if God has given his Holy Spirit to the God-fearers, how can we withhold the sign of the new covenant, the sign of the church of Jesus Christ, the sign of water baptism from them? And so they are baptized, not only in the Spirit, but with water. So we see now that three of these four groups are received into the life of the church. And then what follows, as I said, is the expansion of the church to and through the whole world, the world of that day, to Greece, to Rome, to the islands, uh, to Asia Minor, as Paul goes on his missionary journeys. And we read later on in the book of Acts of Paul's ministry in Ephesus, where the Ephesian Christians have their own little mini Pentecost, where they also received the Holy Ghost in a manner similar to what happens to the Samaritans and what happened at Cornelius' household. 
And say, so as Luke takes us through this journey of the expansion of the church, as I said, in concentric circles, he begins in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, the uttermost parts of the earth, and he includes in his history of the early church the conversion of all four of these groups. Because the Ephesians weren't God-fearers initially, they were just plain old Gentiles. Now again, when we get to the epistles of the New Testament, we will see that the fiercest controversy that erupted in the early church was the question over how do the Gentiles fit in? And Paul has to teach the church the mystery, the musterion, the mystery that once had been hidden, but now was being revealed, which was Christ in you, that is, Christ in the Gentiles. Christ became now the hope not only of Israel, but of the entire Gentile community. Now that motif we will never recognize in its fullness when we come to the epistles of the New Testament unless we have first noticed what is going on here in the book of Acts where Luke reports to us not only the labors of Paul but particularly the work of the Holy Spirit who in, in empowering the church to carry out and fulfill the Great Commission that the Spirit goes before the preaching of the Word. And it is the Spirit who opens the eyes of the Jews. It is the Spirit who opens the eyes of the Samaritans. It is the Spirit who opens the eyes of the God-fearers and of the Gentiles. And as they are converted to Christ, then they receive full inclusion into His body as they receive the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm afraid that in our day, we have a tendency to have way too low of the view of a view of Pentecost. Is that the day of Pentecost is an explosion of divine redemptive power on the world, on this church. And it is no longer something that is restricted or isolated to one people. But now the mystery that was hidden in ages past is being unfolded. That God is going to bring people from every tongue and every tribe and every nation and gather them into the body of Christ. Each one visited and empowered by His Spirit.